and thanks so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Chris Renton, uh, and I serve as the Associate Director of Communications and Marketing here at the Yale Peabody Museum. Um, <clears throat> I can't be sure how all of you heard about this program, uh, but I am glad you registered uh, and encourage you to sign up for our email list uh, at our website and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook if you can. Uh, we are recording this lecture and it will be available uh, hopefully as early as tomorrow uh, at our YouTube channel um, in case you miss anything or want to share it with anyone. Um, before I introduce our uh, esteemed speaker for the day, uh, I want to go over the schedule, sort of a run of show and a couple ground rules uh, that I hope will make this uh, experience a little more enjoyable, enjoyable for everyone. Um, Dr. Manning will present for roughly 20 minutes uh, and then we'll transition into a live question and answer session for another 10 to 15. Uh, you'll note that we disabled the chat function, which you might be used to on Zoom. Um, in its place, we have enabled the Q&A. Uh, please do uh, use that uh, during, our, during or immediately following the lecture uh, to submit your questions. We've got a lot of folks in attendance, so I beg your patience and understanding uh, if we aren't able to get to your question. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, you should have received my contact information and your registration confirmation. Uh, please send any unanswered questions to me and I'll pass them along to Dr. Manning. Alternatively, if you're on Twitter, uh, his handle is at JG Manning, uh, and uh, so that's at JG Manning, and you can exchange correspondence with him directly uh, there. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, our speaker. Uh, Dr. Joseph Manning is the William K. and Marilyn Milton Simpson Professor of Classics and professor of history here at Yale. Uh, he is also a senior research scholar at the Yale Law School and professor at the Yale School of the Environment. Uh, before coming to Yale, he taught at Princeton and Stanford uh, and was educated at uh, the Ohio State University and uh, the University of Chicago. Um, his early work uh, was within a framework he terms analytical papyrology, uh, interpreting those earliest texts uh, and then using them to better understand Hellenistic Mediterranean economic history, uh, focusing especially on Ptolemaic Egypt. Uh, his current research, uh, which he will be covering today, obviously, uh, centers on an investigation into the role of climate change uh, on the development of human societies since the last ice age. Uh, his latest book, The Open Sea, just came out in paperback. Uh, it's from Princeton University Press. And uh, the research he'll be detailing today uh, derives from a National Science Foundation grant in partnership with the Peabody Museum. Uh, it's a special pleasure to welcome you, Dr. Manning, um, and I'll let you uh, take it away. Fantastic, Chris. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody. I can't see you all, uh, but thank you for, for um, coming to this virtual lecture. It's a real pleasure for me to talk about this work a little bit. I am uh, more than happy to stick around afterwards for as long as you want, but since we're recording it, that might not work. Um, but of course, I'm happy to continue the conversation um, and by some other um, means uh, because 15 minutes is probably not enough uh, question time. So as Chris said, I am going to speak for about 20, 25 minutes. Some of you may have heard me before on some of this. Um, so I'm not going to belabor some of the points, but uh, trust me, I've got lots of uh, extra slides um, that I can go through and explain uh, as best I can the science side of things um, or the historical interpretive um, work that is very much um, ongoing. Um, today, I wanna to talk specifically about this paper that came out in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's actually in this week's print edition. It came out online uh, on the 22nd of June um, originally. And the project, or I should say the paper, overlaps our National Science Foundation project based at Yale here. This is some of the team um, right to left, this is uh, Francis Ludlow, who was a postdoc at Yale. He's now at Trinity um, in Dublin. Michael Siegel has been sort of a, a quasi-formal um, partner, a brilliant geochemist, um, now in Bern. He was at Joel McConnell's lab out at the DRI in Reno. Um, and his work continues and really is the basis of, uh, the, of this paper. That's me. Um, Nadia Grusaru next to me, who's a, a just graduated Yale College, who's been our project manager. She's still continuing on the project, uh, thank goodness. Hey, Joe. Uh, Jen Marlin from um, the Yale School um, of the Environment, who's working on our climate proxies, and one of our climate modelers, um, that's Allegra Legrand, who's at um, NASA GIS, also Costa Sugaritas, who's at NASA GIS, 
um, Zan Stein, who's um, at San Francisco State University working on the statistical analytical um, work we plan on doing. Um, and there's a few other people we've just added uh, to the project. So um, that's the Yale based um, project. And we're working primarily on volcanic impacts um, on the Nile watershed. And we're look, looking at the Euphrates, but this has global implications um, too. Um, and the paper is really in collaboration with uh, the Volcanic Impacts on Climate and Society Working Group, the VIX group. It's sponsored by Pages um, in Bern. And if you notice the 20 person author uh, paper, a lot of these people have been involved uh, in the VIX um, group, which has been going steady now for, um, for about eight years. So this is a real serious collaborative effort between specific uh, projects here and this international um, project. So. Hey, Joe. Um, oh, Joe, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Um, no problem. Do you, do you mind sharing your screen for the folks? Oh, gosh. I thought I was sharing the screen. Okay. okay. I, isn't that funny? Um, you know what? I uh, I got to hit the share screen button before I do the PowerPoint. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. You can tell I've been on leave all spring. <laughs> I'm sorry, no everybody. Is that better? Sure is. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so um, Okmuk uh, volcano or Mount Okmuk, which on this slide is on the uppermost uh, upper right hand corner here. That's the caldera. This is a, a quite volcanic part of the world. Um, as you all know, in the, the Aleutian chain, there are three volcanoes on Umnak Island um, here. And you notice four uh, small islands to the southwest. Um, all of which have their own volcanoes um, on them. It's, it's remarkable. Um, and I want to learn more, by the way, just as a footnote uh, for those in the audience who might work on um, uh, Native Alaskan um, traditions, there must be a heck of a lot of very good folklore around these islands and around the volcanism in these islands that I would love to learn more about because I find, find that quite, quite fascinating. Okay, well, here's the team that, I, that I've just, part of the team that I've just <laughs> explained. Here, this is taken uh, in Dublin last summer where we all met at the uh, INQA um, uh, meetings um, and had a great uh, conversation um, at dinner. So this is the Yale-based National Science Foundation um, project. Um, and I should really thank here, before I really get going, David Skelly, who's been a, a great supporter um, of uh, the project before it was a project. I'm, really, I'm continuing to be grateful to David, uh, his leadership uh, his, and his friendship and to administrative um, staff who are um, really running our project for us, in particular, Sarah Morrill at the Peabody. Um, really um, continue to be grateful. It's uh, been remarkably easy so far um, be because, of, because of them. All right, um, with that as a background now, um, just to locate where uh, Umnak Island is and um, this volcano, which some of you may know, but a lot of you may not know, here it is um, in the mid Aleutian um, chain. Um, way out west um, in Alaska in this volcanic um, sort of midway through the Ring of Fire, um, I guess. Um, it's been known for quite a while, of course, um, as an important um, volcano, um, but um, not like it is uh, now. Um, another kind of remote area that's really important for our story historically, both for Egypt um, and for the Mediterranean um, is um, Lake Tana in Ethiopia in the Ethiopian highlands, which is the source from summer monsoonal rains um, of the Blue Nile, which feeds um, into uh, the main Nile channel, uh, meeting the White Nile at Khartoum, um, and really responsible for something like 80% of the annual flood waters um, that hit Egypt. So that's the lifeblood um, of Egypt, and this is driven by the East African uh, monsoon, which you can visually see here pretty, pretty clearly already. So these are two rather remote spots on the earth, which is, uh, we think, uh, driving a lot of uh, politics, economics, um, and, and other things um, in, uh, in Egypt in this period, and as well as the Mediterranean. Um, dramatic photograph of Umnak Island here um, on an incredibly rare, clear day. Um, it's usually rainy and pretty crummy uh, in this part of the world most of the time. So this is a fantastic uh, um, image of this volcanic landscape, I think. Um, Okmuk is still an active volcano. The last large eruption anyway was in 2008. Uh, these are great uh, photographs on the left by Jessica Larson, who was part of the paper at the Alaska Volcano Observatory um, and some of the impact of the uh, 2008 eruption uh, photographed by Janet Schaefer um, on, on the right here. 
Um, Umnak Island, uh, it's a remarkable place. I have not been there myself, I confess. I'm planning on going uh, next summer and really looking forward to it. Reminds me a lot of Iceland, just from looking at, at photographs. Um, this is not Okmuk, by the way, another volcano um, on the island with about 40 residents now on this island. And um, remarkably, I think 7,500 or so um, wild um, cattle um, left over from uh, when this was a big military uh, base um, during World War II. So it's a remarkable place, rather remote, um, sparsely populated um, these days, uh, but now we think an important place um, in um, Western civilization. Just to remind us uh, what we're doing here, we're trying to combine historical or human archival um, information, written, archaeological, and so on, um, with what are called natural archives or climate um, proxies, uh, and this is a great uh, image that was just published in the Pages uh, Group uh, newsletter a couple of weeks ago that shows you some of the main climate proxies we know to reconstruct um, temperature as well as other things, and it's ice cores that we are most concerned about here from polar ice in the Greenland ice sheet um, and um, the Antarctic, which preserves certainly records of temperature, um, but it preserves um, large volcanic eruptions from precipitating out of sulfates um, from uh, large eruptions that are circulating hemispherically um, or, or globally. And this has been revolutionized uh, by Joe McConnell um, and Michael Siegel um, in particular. Um, much higher resolution sorts of uh, analysis now, um, in part because of extremely intelligent geochemistry, I think, um, and also because of the machinery um, used, these uh, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometers can measure the presence of isotopes in the parts per quadrillion, um, which is yielding, of course, really high resolution um, data. And that's incredibly um, exciting, even for historians like me, because Okmuk, we knew erupted 50 BC plus or minus a century. Um, and now in our paper, we are saying it erupted in the early winter of 43 BC. That's a huge difference um, in how we understand uh, this volcano, how we, how we do climate modeling and how we integrate climate data with historical data because now we're at the same scale as our historical um, record. So ice core geochemists and the people who go out and core ice are my uh, definitely my heroes uh, and I'd be tempted to study more geochemistry in college if I were um, a young person. It's fascinating work. It's not particularly new. It goes back to the late 40s, of course, but uh, it's been revolutionized in the last few years. Um, and that's really um, changing the game, um, I think. Um, the reason we know about cooling um, and, the, and helping secure the date um, are tree rings, of course. Um, this is a bristlecone pine. Uh, tree ring from the White Mountains uh, in um, the Sierra Nevada range um, in California. And you can clearly see here the frost ring um, at 43 BC, which really sort of tells us that um, this was a really cold um, period um, historically and for several years um, after the eruption, we think, after 43 um, BC. So we're using um, not just ice cores um, in this study, but um, tree rings um, as well as a tephra analysis here which is really, I think, probably at the core um, of the paper, Jill Plunkett's work um, in Belfast. Her lab there is the lab that has nailed down uh, that this is Okmuk, the Okmuk II um, eruption pretty clearly. It's got nothing to do with Etna. It's got nothing to do with um, the Central American volcanoes, which was the other obvious uh, place people have been talking about. It's, uh, I think, pretty certain um, Okmuk now. And in the paper, we've modeled um, the cooling impacts here, um, we've looked at several different um, ice cores um, from, from Greenland. We even looked at um, some speleothems from China, all line up um, pretty well with what we know um, historically what's going on in Egypt um, and the Mediterranean world, which is actually um, quite a lot. But we think also, and we can talk more about that in question time, um, uh, this is a world historical um, event as well. So here's um, page one of, of the paper. Um, I think it's still behind a paywall. If you're desperate to see it and can't see it for some reason, um, let me know. And don't tell PNAS, but I can send it along to you. Um, this is the paper itself. And actually, Clive Oppenheimer, the Cambridge uh, volcanologist, published a really lovely commentary piece that came out yesterday in PNAS um, about um, the paper and is sort of 
general thoughts about um, volcanism and uh, volcanoes um, and history. So um, just a three page paper, highly recommended. It's really, it's really a nice, um, nice piece of work and it's nice to have it. So Oknuk 2, just really quickly, um, is a large eruption. Um, we knew there was a large eruption around 44 BC or so anyway from ice core analysis. It's, if you're keeping score at home, it's a VEI um, of, of six point something. Um, so historically pretty large. And in fact, it's the largest Northern hemisphere eruption in the last two and a half thousand years. Um, by quite some distance. So this is not just an ordinary large eruption um, like Pinatuba, which is the last really explosive eruption we've had in the world that's impacted global climate in any way. So it's been a while, um, but this is, a, this is a very large um, eruption. And you can tell that also by looking at the caldera from the satellite image of Okmuk. Uh, the caldera is 10 kilometers wide. Um, this was a really enormous eruption. You get that sense from just looking at the, at the landscape. Now, on the somewhat funny side, we've gotten really great press coverage. Um, New York Times had a nice piece. That's always nice. A lot of stories around the world, though, um, tend to come up with this sort of thing um, because they're looking at a press release. They're not talking to us, anybody on the paper. They look at a press release, um, and they make some interpretations of the press release. Uh, they even, even interview people about their reactions to what they think is going on without looking at the paper, and we get this sort of very dramatic, a volcano has ended the Roman Republic, it has ended the Ptolemies, and caused the rise of the Roman Empire all in a single um, stroke. That is not exactly what we claim, uh, and it's worth talking about, uh, I think, in some detail. I'll leave that um, to the end of the 20 minutes here or so um, and to, to question time, but this is what happens when you work in this sort of, this sort of um, field. Um, there's kind of a close-up, slightly fuzzy of the, Okmuk caldera on the left. Um, and on the right, um, you'll recognize some of you, um, Vesuvius. We think of eruptions generally as having local impacts. If you live underneath Vesuvius in AD 79, and here on the left, the great description of Pliny the Younger um, talking about this eruption in real time, um, it's kind of bad. Uh, you don't want to live underneath a really large um, volcanic um, eruption. It, it's, uh, it's quite dangerous and often can be um, deadly. And that's what people tend to think about volcanic eruptions, big local impacts with eruptions, but nothing more. But the thing we're claiming in this paper and others, many others uh, before us have now well-established <clears throat> large or explosive volcanic eruptions that inject sulfates into the stratosphere, um, pretty big eruption therefore, uh, and circulating hemispherically or globally actually reduce solar radiation, which causes a cooling um, impact on the global climate system. Um, and it also perturbs um, the, the monsoon um, parts of the, of the world. Um, so it can have a significant climate impact, normally of a year or two historically, but when you have a really large eruption like Okmuk um, or a cluster of eruptions closely spaced in time, this can have a more extended impact on climate. And that's what we think is happening here. To give a really good example, of Alaska, which just so happens to be my favorite place on the planet for, for other reasons. Um, what's called the Katmai eruption or the Nova erupt, the newly erupted eruption in southern Alaska in 1912. Katmai here actually did not erupt. It, it actually um, um, imploded though, um, in a sense, because of the size of Nova erupt, the fissure. Um, it was a very large eruption, also VEI-6. Uh, it has global impacts for uh, a couple years um, on, on cooling, a, a pretty remote part of the world. Um, we even have descriptions of the eruption impacting Kodiak Island uh, in unpublished letters in the Beinecke Library, which are really fascinating to read, um, um, in fact. On the right is the Nova eruptive fissure. It's some several kilometers away from Katmai, um, actually, and it wasn't until the 60s before this was identified as the, as the source um, eruption of, of Nova Erupta. Um, and uh, we know uh, it's now a national park to the landscape. It's still quite volcanic um, there. And we know Kodiak Island, uh, 100 miles away or so across the Shelikov Strait, is buried in a couple of feet of ash from this eruption. There's some very dramatic images here that were taken by National Geographic, published in the way in National Geographic um, just after the eruption. Pretty dramatic indeed from 100 miles away. So, you know, even sort of regional impacts um, for sure. But these global impacts of large eruptions are now pretty well understood. The cartoon on the right gives you some of the 
some of the physical processes that are involved in really large eruptions impacting um, global climate system. I won't belabor the point. Happy to talk uh, more about it. But Pinatubo here on the left, um, thanks to uh, Alan Robach uh, photographs here from the space shuttle, a before and after shot of the sulfates uh, in the Northern hemisphere, several layers of, of sulfate in the stratosphere. That's uh, reflecting uh, solar radiation and cooling the earth. That's the, the physical mechanism that we're looking at for the cooling, as well as for perturbing the, uh, the monsoon um, around the world. And a photograph or an image I always show now is, the red is the rain around the monsoon, uh, which sits just north of the equator and it migrates northward every early summer months and causes monsoonal rain as you see in the circle in um, East Africa around Lake Tana, which is coming up. You can see it get really red right there. That is Egyptian history in a nutshell, but you can also see uh, South Asia lighting up uh, and, and East Asia, uh, for example. What large volcanic eruptions do is weaken the monsoon's movement or preventing it from moving altogether. So you don't get rain in South Asia. You don't get rain um, in East Africa or weakening of it which means less flood water in the Nile River um, Basin, um, for example. <clears throat> and we know the impact of Katmai the, the year following, actually in 1913, both the Niger River in the green and the Nile River um, in the red here um, are at their lowest for um, several decades um, in either direction. So it's a dramatic impact on river flow um, across Africa. Um, because of the 1912 um, eruption. So that's the sort of thing we're looking at in this newly identified um, eruption. And again, Lake Tana is really the important thing. The White Nile is an insignificant contributor to uh, the floodwaters, the summer flood um, for Egypt. Um, indeed, it's really the Blue Nile here that's the most important um, contribution um, to, um, to Egypt um, anyway. In the paper we've published, we've given you some preliminary modeling of the impact on um, precipitation and, and temperature, um, wetter in the northern Mediterranean um, and significantly colder in a good part of the Mediterranean, not uniform of course, but this is really dramatic. I was surprised to see this on the right here. There is a, almost a decade long temperature departure from background um, because of um, Okmuk, it, it looks like according to the preliminary modeling, which is really significant. Initially, really uh, great cooling, um, and then quite a while to, to get back to the background um, state. So no other measures of the significance of this uh, Okmuk eruption, eruption in 43 BC. Okay, just turning really quickly to the, the history. Um, the 40s BC, really well known in Mediterranean history because of the, the end of the Roman Republic, of course. This is a well-told story. The sources are the sources we have, basically. Um, they're, they're interesting, um, there's been a lot written on the Roman Republic. It's all about politics, um, of course, um, in the internecine civil wars um, that, that are driving those um, politics. Um, for Egypt in the 40s, this statement by Dorothy uh, Thompson in the Cambridge Ancient History, this rather laconic statement, kind of sums up what we know. Evidence does not appear to add up to a picture of, does appear to add up to a picture of widespread disaster in these years. Um, and yes, we're saying absolutely for sure that's the case um, and probably more significantly so than we have sources um, to confirm that. We have very few sources, for example, from the 30s uh, BC in Egypt. It's a bit of a blank decade, the last decade of Ptolemaic rule in Egypt, a bit mysterious. We can explain that absence um, in some ways, we can make up some good stories. Uh, in fact, we don't know, but given what we know of the late 40s um, BC and the, and the uh, early 30s BC, the events that are unleashed um, are not gonna just suddenly quit with a good uh, Nile flood. So we would guess um, that a good part of the 30s was probably relatively um, ugly in Egypt. We should also point out that Etna is also erupting uh, beginning in 44 BC. And that explains, we think, and we go through this in the paper, some of the Roman sources which talk about the portends, the atmospheric uh, phenomena that we hear about in Roman sources around the assassination of Julius Caesar in March of 44 BC. So that probably explains um, the local uh, impacts. Um, there's also a um, tropical eruption, perhaps in Indonesia somewhere. 
Uh, we don't know for sure in 45 BC, not a very large one, but we know there's an eruption that shows up in the ice cores in 45. And then we have this Okmuk eruption, which is this monster um, in the early winter of, of 43. So there's at least three volcanoes, um, one of which probably has serious global climate impacts. Others have uh, perhaps more psychological um, impacts um, in the local area um, of the Mediterranean. It's a picture that's not you know, fully told yet perhaps, but you know, the, the picture is a bit um, uh, clearer. We do know uh, from Roman sources that the Nile does not flood at all for at least two years in a row. This is Seneca telling us this. Um, uh, years 43 and 42 BC, this would be, um, there, there was successive failures of, of the Nile um, River at least um, for two years um, in a row. Um, we know from this wonderful source, which is really tough to read, and don't worry, this is not a bad photograph. It's really tough to read in person. This was on display in this exhibit last year at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. It's an amazing text. It's actually a recarving. It's a decree by the local governor of Southern Egypt, of Upper Egypt, of what's called the Thebaid, in probably 39 BC, talking about the ongoing um, famine, severe famine, he says, caused by crop failure, like none hitherto recorded when the city, that is Thebes, had, had been crushed. The famine is persisting and even becoming worse. There's a failure of the flood um, and increasing misery throughout the land. This is probably the description of the events that are caused by now failure, we think attributed to the Okmuk um, eruption, uh, fairly um, dire and, and probably um, continuing and pretty much our sources um, break off almost entirely as far as, um, as far as we know them. But everything we know, in terms of documents, in terms of the literary evidence suggests it's pretty bad in Egypt. It's pretty bad in the Roman Republic, primarily because of the cold um, produced by the eruption in the Northern Mediterranean world and uh, flood failure in Egypt. And of course, Cleopatra's Egypt and the late Roman Republic are interlinked for food supply, but also for, uh, politically um, and so on. So these are stories that are told together because they need to be told um, together, of course. And we've drawn up uh, a kind of a nice attempt to sort of capture um, everything here. Just to kind of conclude about Egypt, by the way, I think it's a, this is a history we can think about rewriting a little bit now. We know, for example, um, that there's, uh, troubles began um, in 50 um, BC, also uh, around 50 um, in Republican um, Rome. We know um, the Nile uh, is probably failing in for uh, 50 BC. We know in 48 BC, Pliny tells us it's at the lowest ever recorded um, at five cubits. So there are now failures for whatever reason. The guess would be um, El Nino years, which are another driver of Nile variability. Um, and then uh, at least 43, 42 and ongoing. So we're, we're talking about a decade plus of sustained <clears throat> Nile River um, problems uh, and probably um, other sorts of climactic um, drivers um, in the Mediterranean, which is really um, probably significant. And it, a part, we think, of the story of the end of the Roman Republic uh, and the end of the Ptolemies. Significantly here now, post-Okmuk eruption here, it's the second coldest decade uh, in the last two and a half thousand years. The coldest decade is the mid-6th century AD, complete with uh, the pandemic, uh, of course, um, that kind of launched what is now called the late antique little ice age. And we can talk about periodization um, if you want, but we're talking about uh, a very cold decade after 43 um, BC and probably superimposed on the so-called Roman warming period, which, is, which may be significant, I haven't explored that, but we think this is pretty significant. Again, two volcanic peaks that are in the ice cores in 45 um, and we think um, in, in 43 BC. Um, tell this um, story, we think, pretty well. And interestingly, the authoritative Cambridge Ancient History periodizes uh, Roman history um, this way, um, beginning with 43 BC, end of the Republic by all, by all, um, by all measures, uh, the beginning of authoritarian rule um, in November 43 BC. So even traditional political history um, marks this as a boundary. Um, and we think the climate story here, and there's more work to do on it for sure, um, plays some role um, in this periodization. It, it seems to make um, pretty good um, sense to us. We're even looking further afield, thanks to Phyllis Granoff in religious studies at Yale, 
uh, who's an expert on uh, the Jain religion and Jain texts, there's a tradition in um, 13th century texts and other Jain texts of a massive famine. This is the translation, I won't read it out. Um, in the text, a 12 year famine, very severe, sometime in the first century BC. Um, now, according to our modeling, South Asia is really, uh, uh, has a severe drought after 43 BC. Everyone we've asked says the dating works. We don't know for sure, um, but we think perhaps we can locate this severe famine in, South, in Sri Lanka in this case, um, and perhaps in the um, Indian subcontinent also beginning in 43 BC. We know also there's severe famine in the late 40s BC and tremendous social unrest um, in Han, China. So East Asia also um, goes through some trouble, probably the same uh, monsoon failure. So we can tell a story that uh, links the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean world um, very well for uh, perhaps um, up to um, a decade. And there's probably more to go with the historical work because no one's ever looked at this particular period um, before in a very focused way. I will stop there and I open it up and look forward to comments, criticisms, questions, and your thoughts. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, sometimes I have to sort of jump in and, uh, and, and ask a question um, to kick things off, but we've gotten a number of great questions uh, while you were speaking. Uh, so I'll, I'll dive right in with them and encourage uh, folks who have questions um, to submit them again at the Q&A function at the bottom. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can in, in 15 minutes. Um, so uh, one that came in early uh, that I wanted to get to was around uh, sort of lag times uh, yeah. in your modeling. Like, um, is there, so let's just take uh, the eruption of Okmuk. Um, yeah. Is there a lag between the actual eruption and the local effects that are felt in Egypt or Southeast Asia? Yeah, no, it, 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 certainly it takes time for, this, for the sulfates to circulate um, in the stratosphere um, around the world se several months, uh, presumably. And I think that's pretty well studied um, in, in ice cores and I can't really answer any detail, but I think that's something we, we worry about. Um, and you know, the, the timing of eruptions is super important. This is why it's exciting we're getting seasonality um, from the ice cores from Joe McConnell's um, lab because Krakatoa, for example, uh, in Indonesia in 1883 that erupts, I think it's June of 1883, looks like it has no impact on the Nile um, at all um, that year because the Nile is already in flood um, in June, for example. And I, I don't think it's the year after there isn't an impact either for whatever reason. So, you know, not all the, lo the location of the eruption, uh, the nature of the eruption, the size of it, the, the chemical nature of it, uh, the timing of it, all of that matters a heck of a lot, of course. So yeah, there's a lag time. We, we think though that early winter, sort of February 43 BC would work um, for impacting the Nile watershed um, by, by June or so. Okay. Um, um, I'm happy to you know, hear thoughts on that. Um, you know, climate modelers are, you know, and our own models on our, models on our project are also working on this now. Um, and we'll, we'll come up with um, um, their thoughts that we're looking forward to um, in, a, in a month or two. Um, so, you know, there's more work to do on the modeling, but so far it looks pretty good for, for winter 43 impacting the Nile watershed in summer 43. Okay. Um, and there's a couple sort of specific questions coming in, um, but I think they can all be kind of grouped under this sort of, uh, there's a curiosity with the folks watching around um, kind of reportage on, on, on the events. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, you know, did, what are some of the recordings that you're coming across um, from Romans, uh, for example, about these uh, sort of catastrophic changes taking place? Uh, recordings, you mean um, thoughts from Roman historians or? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't pay attention to social media a lot on this sort of stuff. Um, uh, I peek at it once in a while. I think uh, my impression is it's a little bit crabby. Um, <laughs> For a lot of reasons, uh, you know, um, one, we're, we're actually challenging um, a story that's been around uh, for <laughs> many centuries. Um, not, not a lot, I, I think, you know, again, the, the knee jerk reaction is one, not reading the paper, reading some of the, some of the um, news stories that are overly dramatic, looking at press releases and interpreting the press release, not reading the article. Um, and, and two, there's, you know, there's, there's good resistance to, the, you know, hey, we, we want to challenge the, the, the politics here. This, this had no role in the end of the Republic. The Republic was already done, for example. 
Yeah, it was it definitely problematic, uh, no doubt about it. Um, a single eruption is not going to do, um, it's not going to end the Roman Republic for sure. But you know, you start putting together the entire climate story, let's say from 60 to 30, um, climactic shocks are going to play some role. We think we ex we're explaining the, all the sources we have for the late 40s BC, uh, food supply issues, very cold um, um, problems, um, military um, issues, um, and of course, uh, the, the Nile um, and food supply coming from Egypt, which uh, Rome was already relying on, of course. Um, and there's a famous story that Cleopatra says, I can't send you grain, um, Rome, I'm having trouble. And, and no one believed that she's kind of making it up. Well, no, um, <laughs> it looks pretty true. Um, in fact, Cleopatra is opening up uh, the royal granaries in Alexandria to feed, to feed people. Um, it's, it's a pretty severe crisis, um, we think. So, you know, I think there, I haven't seen all reaction. Um, I haven't heard a lot of reaction, people emailing me saying, oh, wow, great, or oh, wow, horrible. Um, so, you know. Um, there, the, yeah. there's, a, there's a, another question, sort of uh, another sort of specific question around, um, how the Nile failure might have affected uh, military transport. Um, do you, is there any record of like this sort of uh, the implications of this on, on, on any military activity? Uh, in Egypt, not that I know of, but I, I don't know if, um, what the questioner is referring to. Maybe I'm forgetting something. Um, there are Roman sources that talk about uh, Roman movement of armies um, in, the, in 43, 42. Um, that looks like it, it's related both to food supply issues um, and severe cold. Um, and the initial cold, by the way, we're not talking, you know, it's a little bit cool summer. I mean, the initial temperature departure from the models is eight degrees centigrade. Wow. <laughs> um, that, that, that's uh, really significant in the North Mediterranean. You know, I mean, it, it looks like really cold uh, summers for, for a couple of years. And that's confirmed also by the tree rings in California. So anyway. Yeah, unless I'm forgetting something. Um, wow. Uh, there's yeah. a, I, 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 we've, we found a, I have an interesting question from um, a viewer named Viviana who is writing from 15 kilometers west from the El Pongo caldera. I haven't had a chance to look up uh, where that is exactly, so apologies to Viviana. Um, she would like to know your opinion of how you, uh, of, of, of some of, of how you feel when you see news that state that a large tropical volcanic eruption would be a blessing to counteract the effects of climate change. Yeah, yeah, so this, I mean, it's a great question. Um, is this, did you say Ilopongo? Yes. In, in Nicaragua, I think? Uh, yeah, I, I can look it up while you respond. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that was, I think I was one of the candidates for this eruption too. It definitely erupted, uh, you know, within a few years of this. Um, and has an impact on uh, Maya, um, I think. Yeah, so, you know, volcanic eruptions are interesting. They're well studied now, and that's why they're, it's a hot topic, no pun intended, and modeling is really important because of geoengineering. And this is sort of plan B that Bill Gates, I think, and others have said, well, if we can't get our act together globally to reduce carbon emissions, um, we can always geoengineer the atmosphere to cool. Um, and gosh, you know, I mean, Geoengineering is putting sulfates or sulfate-like things in the stratosphere to reflect solar radiation and cool the earth. But what, what the historical studies are, are, what we think we're showing and, and others, um, and, and uh, um, Robach at, at Rutgers, who's kind of the pioneer in the modeling of, the, of volcanic impacts and of nuclear winters, um, is um, that there's going to be unintended consequences um, of doing that, including imposing drought on sensitive areas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the monsoon areas in the world are 70% of the Earth's human population right now. So, you know, if we geoengineer the atmosphere, besides making the sky nice and brown forever and having, um, you know, no more blue skies and some other things, we're going to impose drought, presumably, on, on sensitive parts of the world. Um, which ye yields things like mass migration and other things one can imagine. So I think, I think we're saying probably caution is in order here, um, that large eruptions, wherever they are, um, in uh, the tropics or in the high north latitudes or, or wherever, um, you know, they're, they're problematic. Um, it, they're teaching us that geoengineering the atmosphere, while we can do it, um, will have some pretty serious consequences. Hmm.
Um, just to, to finish that one out, uh, I got confirmation uh, from Viviana that it is uh, El Salvador. Um, sorry, El Salvador. Thank you. Yeah. It's okay. okay. Thanks. Um, sorry. It's, uh, I got a, another really good one from, uh, from Dave, uh, who asks, um, have you compared this to the eruption of the Icelandic volcano Katla, which is said to have caused crop failure in Europe and thus had a significant impact on the French Revolution? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, um, no, not yet, but our, the VIX group, I mean, so what we're doing in the VIX group, actually uh, my little group and uh, our project has been focusing on the 160s BC. Um, we got convinced Frank and I to join this paper. For, obviously we're very, extremely happy um, and it's related to our work, um, but we're working on decadal case studies. And so that is being studied, uh, Katla. We're, we're actually studying the last two and a half thousand years um, and with new ice core work, High res ice cores coming in September. Um, stay tuned. Four thousand years of high res data. We'll have the whole Bronze Age. It'll be interesting. Um, you know, we're, we're we're producing case studies. Um, so we're we're going to be able to uh, have intercomparison. Um, the other one I'm interested in, and with our group, what we're doing this summer um, is modeling um, the Nova Rupta eruption in Alaska and Okmuk. Um, they're different eruptions. They're both VEI six, but uh, they're a little bit, they're different though, um, but they're both Alaskan. It looks like they have global impacts, you know, so um, we can compare, uh, you know, different eruptions um, and their impacts. Um, and that's exactly what the VIX group um, is doing for the last two and a half thousand years at least. So stay tuned. I mean, you know, that, that's another year worth of work um, or so, but that's, um, that's coming, you know, and there's differential impacts on volcanoes uh, depending on where you are in the world. and. Uh, which is why we're interested in kind of pursuing the historical angle with 43 BC. Um, I know from reading uh, some of the other articles that came out, um, there are a number of wonderful images of uh, those ancient nilometers. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, one of our viewers, Bob, was wondering about um, the quality of the nilometer charts spanning that period. Um, are, are they fairly precise? Are they, are they, are you able to conclude anything from them? So uh, we don't have we don't have nilometer records um, at all from these years. We have uh, plenty, uh, plenty of descriptions. Um, for example, we have some nilometer records from the Ptolemaic period. Um, what we've done in our project here, um, along with Joe Morgan, one of my graduate students, um, and Nazim Serbist, another graduate student here of mine, on um, the last year or so, we've coded all historical sources from Egypt from the papyri and inscriptions. Um, in the last three centuries or so BC. Um, and most uh, around condi Nile conditions anywhere in Egypt. And they're mostly qualitative records. They're mostly things like a lease of land or a letter from some place that we geocode saying, you know, we're having a good crop this year or the Nile has reached our land this year. And we code that as that's a normal year or, or, or so. It's in the normal range as, or if a letter says, you know, there's no water or the land is dry this year, we're going to code that differently. So we've, we've coded all, everything we've got, um, a couple of nilometer records, but, but most of them, most um, don't survive. They were taken, um, yeah, usually in, in uh, Elephantine Island um, in the south, but they were definitely taken every year going back to 3000 BC. Um, mainly qualitative, and we're going to code them against the volcanic record and other things we had to see what the record looks like. Which is we did which we did, we did it preliminarily on the paper we published in 2017. So now we have a lot more historical data, and we're going to see what it looks like. And we hope it it turns out um, that it's an, it's a good source and reliable source, but we don't know. You know that's what we're doing now in, in year three of the project. Now that we've coded um, everything we think we can code. Gotcha. More work to be done. A lot more work to be done. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's a quick correction that came in in our Q&A, uh, uh, in, in the Q&A, it would appear, uh, and maybe you can, uh, Michael has suggested that the 1783 volcano was Grimsvatten and not Katla. Okay, so. cool. Is that Michael Siegel or? Uh, I, I don't want, um, I hope okay. he doesn't mind, <laughs> hope he doesn't mind him, but yes. Uh, yeah, great, cool. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, so then uh, I think I want to close out, uh, and sorry again um, to anyone whose questions we missed, uh, but I want to close out with a great uh, question um, 
as a, as a university uh, museum. Um, what advice would you give to a student with background in geology and volcanoes, but no background in historical methods, who is interested in using those uh, historical records to corroborate geoscience? Oh, cool. Hey, come work for our project um, would be a good advice. I mean, you know, we have different people working on the project and the VIX group um, that, you know, Michael was one of the co-founders of, you know, it's, just, it's so amazing because it's such a diverse group and it's a very friendly group um, of scholars, um, quite diverse, um, you know, go to the AGU meetings if you're in the States, especially, and walk through the posters and learn. And, you know, I do that all the time and I often ask village idiot questions uh, to the, the geo, geophysicist, but that's how I learn. Um, and that's, you know, uh, I think we're opening up a new, a new way of working, um, kind of a new field um, in a way, and it requires, you know, you to sort of break down barriers and, uh, you know, ask questions um, and, um, you know, have different uh, professional social networks um, at a minimum and, you know, start working on a project uh, or, you know, learn some ancient history, read some ancient history. Um, and you know you'll you'll be amazed what you find. Um, the linkages the linkages are um, all over the place. The more you look, of course. Absolutely. So. Um, well, I think we'll close there. I want to say uh, another thank you to you, Dr. Manning, uh, for joining us today. A pleasure. Um, and for all those still on, uh, I hope you'll come to our next one uh, again. Do follow us on social media. Sign up for our email list, uh, and we'll do our best to get the word out when we uh, schedule the next one. So thanks everybody uh, for spending uh, uh, the afternoon with us and uh, we'll see you soon.